welcome to uh, Mansfield's Money Sense. I was having lunch with a mate of mine the other day and he said uh, you should start looking at bonds uh, for an investment. And I said, no, nah, I had one of those and I unfortunately paid it off. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. So uh, I didn't understand. And that's why I grabbed hold of Graham Smale, who's uh, the Director of Interest Rate Products on the JSE. And joining us from our bureau in Cape Town is Vickers Furstenberg, the Portfolio Manager at Future Growth. Good evening, gentlemen. Nice to have you both with us. Vikas, let's start with you. Why should I have a thing called a bond in my portfolio? Well, Jeremy, um, it's, it's, like, it's like finding diversification in your portfolio. Uh, typically, uh, you'll find that over time that owning the thing called a bond in your balanced portfolio will show reduced return volatility compared to other asset classes like equity and in some cases even listed property. At the same time, it also serves as what they, we would call it a risk uh, stabilizer in a portfolio like that, simply because this bond that you own now will pay you an interest every six months, most of them, and you can basically count on that cash flow as well as the, the size of that flow. So both in terms of timing and also the amount of that cash flow that it will pay you over time, it's very, very predictable. And that, that's, I think, two of the most important reasons why you need to own a bond in a balanced portfolio. Okay, now, Graham, I've now taken the advice from, from Vickers. He said to me, I need to have a certain part of my portfolio in bonds. Firstly, how easy is it to get your hands on these? Relatively easy and through more than one channel. Okay. The, the first point actually to, that somebody needs to ask you is what size are you dealing with uh, in wanting to invest in bonds? The marketplace that the Johannesburg Stock Exchange runs tends to be the wholesale market. So Vickers is, um, is a portfolio manager managing a lot of portfolio bonds and that's typically the type of um, person or entity that interacts in our marketplace. So if you were going to access bonds directly on the, on the exchange in a listed way through your stockbroker, for example, like you would do with equities, you would need to be talking at least 500,000 Rand clips. So in the context of on exchange trading, it tends to be a high net worth, ultra high net worth marketplace. Having said that, that does not mean that government bonds or other bonds are not accessible to you as an investor. So there are many other channels. So for example, organizations such as Future Growth represented here today manage collective investment schemes where a number of investors with smaller pots of money bring their capital together and therefore are able to invest in a wholesale marketplace. Um, over and above that, the government itself has launched a retail investor program where you can access interest rates that the government is paying on its bonds directly through the post office, and, and their rates are pretty good relative to the rates in the underlying wholesale marketplace. Vikas, I want to come back to you here because I still don't, there's something that's, that's niggling at the back of my mind. Why would I take my hard-earned money and specifically put it into something that's going to earn me less of a return than I could be earning somewhere else. Why, why is this bond? I, I understand what you're saying about it's a bit more reliable. Um, but what, what's, what percentage of my portfolio should be in, a, in, in the bond market? Jeremy, there's no single quick answer to that question because it's it. really at the end of the <laughs> determined by your risk profile mm. and your need for, for income um, on an ongoing basis. Typically, what, the way we would look at, at this is to say that someone who is really, really young, say for instance like 20 years old uh, and has really only started working now and is starting to build a pension fund, they should be focused on growth. Growth assets, i.e. invest more of your money in a more volatile market like the equity market, uh, which over time, despite that volatility, should give you a better return. And that's what you're referring to. As you get older, though, you would expect to invest a larger portion of your portfolio in a more stable asset class like bonds, simply because at some point you're going to need more stability in terms of your monthly income stream. 
And I think that's where bonds certainly will play a big role. Um, Graham mentioned the products that are, that are managed in, in the market, in, including collective investments um, on the retail side, for instance. And there typically what we find is that as people get older, um, they will have a smaller risk appetite for short-term return volatility. We've experienced that over the last few days in equity market again. And they'll be looking for a bit more stability in their funds. So really, at the end of the day, it's about your risk profile. It's about where you are in terms of your, if I may call it, life cycle. OK, what, what sort of, I, I accept that answer, and I can see the logic behind it. What yeah. sort of returns are we looking at here on, on, on bonds? OK, so if, if you're able to access the wholesale market, there's a, a government bond uh, we use lingo and codes called a 157, which is about a four, just over a four-year bond in the underlying market issued yeah. by the government. Okay, hang on. Well, okay. slow down. So that means I put the money in now. And you get it back in for about just over four years' time. Four years' time. Correct. They pay me the full amount back. Correct, correct. And in the interim, they pay me interest. They pay you interest. Um, what sort of interest are they looking at there? Your effective, your effective rate is around about 7%. That's not bad. Correct. So if you had to go, to, for example, to the retail savings bond, there you have a choice of investing for a two-year period, a three-year period, or five-year period, and there the rates are slightly higher than that. So what the government is doing at the moment in order to incentivize a retail investment mindset, they're in fact paying higher interest rates than they would to a wholesale investor such as Vickers. So in the um, three-year area, they're paying about seven and a half, so in the five-year area, about eight. So they're paying almost half a percent higher than the wholesale investor is, is getting in the wholesale market in order to try and attract some of that capital from the, from the retail sector. Why, why do people issue bonds? Why, why would I want to buy into the government's bonds? Surely I'm paying my taxes already. <laughs> why, must I, the, why, must, why must I give more money? I, I think that the mindset around uh, why governments need to issue bonds, uh, at the end of the day, it boils down to, is it, is, in terms of a cycle, is the government in a phase where it has deficit funding? In other words, it is receiving less money from its taxes than it needs to spend because it's part of that, that cycle. So economies that, that tend to be growing, where there's a lot of capital investment, um, for the long term, those economies, for a large proportion of their life, tend to be in what's called deficit funding. They're getting less money in than, than they need to spend. So in order to do that, they borrow money. So well-developed economies can go through cycles where they are in deficit funding and within, where they're also surplus numbers. They're getting more tax than they need to spend. South Africa had that for a period, a short period. Under the Clinton era, the US had that for a short period. The UK had it post-Thatcher. Um, but as we've seen now, we're now in such a different phase of, of, of life in the economy and the globe that governments are finding that they need to do most of the spending in order to try and keep this engine running. So it's a different kind of reason for why governments are spending than would have happened historically. Okay, but now, Vikas, I, uh, I'm, I'm just a bit concerned about where you're putting my money. Because I'm, yeah. I'm giving you this money now and you are investing yes. it in a government, which mm. I don't think is the best investment around. Um, yes. how, how sure are you about this investment, China? Hmm. <laughs> um, this, <laughs> that's, that's why you're sort of investing with us, because you, you pay us to take that investment view on your behalf. Um, and clearly, I mean, uh, Gray mentioned rates, uh, for instance, 7%, etc. You know, if I may start there, Jeremy, to answer your question, it's going to be quite a long, long, long answer this. Um, you need to compare that expected return of yours to your expected inflation rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's good and all to sort of see what, you know, government is saying in terms of inflation at the moment, sitting at about 5.4%. Uh, but I think we all know that we're not all exactly at that level. I mean, I, I know, for instance, that I think my inflation rate, listening to my wife, is certainly <laughs> higher than that. And if you, look, if, you, if you look at what's been happening to labor unions, some of those guys, I mean, they're sitting at, with, with an inflation rate of over 10% because the, their consumption patterns are different, similar to my wife's, <laughs> but different. And therefore, they would require something higher than that. So if you believe your inflation rate is 8 or 9 or 10%, you're going to earn 7% investing in that bond, clearly you're losing out. Mm -hmm. 
because you're earning a negative, in, uh, a negative uh, rate of return on that investment of yours for the next little while. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to us to make a call in terms of what rate is appropriate given where we expect inflation to be over the next 12, 18 months. So to put it simplistically, if the market, for instance, at the moment is trading at the level of, say, 7%, that's where the market believes that bonds should be trading, and we think inflation is actually going to go to 8 or 9%, clearly we would disagree with the central bank because they don't believe that inflation is going to print far more than 6% over the next 12 months, we would steer away from that market and we would wait for better buying opportunities because typically what happens if that comes through the higher inflation rate, you would see the market reacting to that and that 7% that, referred, that we referred to earlier on would gradually or suddenly increase to higher levels that's more appropriate given the level of inflation so, in the market. So these... So that's what you would expect us to do, is to do market timing. And then the second thing is you mentioned government. Now there we need to take a risk, sorry, there we need to take a view on the risk profile of that borrower, mm. the RSA government in this point, or uh, in, this, in this case, as an example. We're fairly con confident that if we invest in a 5, 10, 15 year bond at the moment, that at the end of that period, that government will pay us our interest rate every six months. And at the end of that term, we'll also repay the capital that we've invested in that asset. And Gray mentioned deficits. Uh, if I may add to that deficit or the shortfall, also the size of outstanding debt. It's very important to have a look at that. In South Africa, for instance, at the moment, depends how you look at it, but it's run about just below 40% of GDP, that's outstanding, the size, of out, the, 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 out, the size of outstanding debt of the South African government. Compare that, for instance, to Greece, which is heading to 150, 170%. So clearly, there's a big difference between those two countries, and therefore, we certainly would rather invest with the South African government because we believe the risk of default on the South African side certainly is much lower than, for instance, in my view, a bankrupt, bankrupt state like, like Greece. Um, the, I take it then that if inflation increases, one, once, once they have stipulated what the interest rate is going to be, that's it. It doesn't increase with um, the, the, the repo rate. I think there are a couple of issues embedded in that. When you talk about they've, uh, they've set the rate, at the end of the day the market broadly sets the rate. So the willing buyer, willing seller marketplace will essentially factor in all the information that it currently sees out there and say that given inflation is, is we believe inflation on average is X, given that we want some top up on top of inflation, mm -hmm. that add those two together generally gives you the rate that the government would, would trade at. Um, so, so the market broadly sets the rate. What the government does set is, is what is called the coupon. So, so the characteristics of, of, of any bond, whether it's issued by a company or by the government, is you give them some money, they promise to give you um, a million rand back if it's a scale for a million rand. They also agree to pay you a percentage on what they're going to pay you back. So it all depends on what the broad level of interest rates is relative to what they call the coupon. And it's called a coupon because in the old days you used to have a piece of paper where you tear off a coupon and you go to the government window and say, please pay me my coupon. So on average, if, if interest rates, for example, are the 7% and the coupon on that bond was also 7%, then in principle you'd give them a million rand to get a million rand back. If the bond promised to pay you a, a higher coupon, so for example 10%, in other words, you're getting more cash back from the mm -hmm. instrument than is broadly allowed, the, the market is saying, you would in fact pay more than a million rand for that bond in order to equate it so that you only get a million rand back at now, the end. Now you see you also raised something there which I didn't know because you said if it's the government or if it's a company so you get these company bonds as well. Correct. I take it Correct. right. Correct. Let's, let's try and get into that a bit later and dig a bit deeper into this. We're talking about bonds. We'll be back in just a moment with our guests. <laughs> 